Hey there, future New York City residents. It's Nadi Evangelista, your go-to real estate agent right here in the amazing New York City Tri-State area. Welcome to my channel, where I dish out all the real estate insights, tips, and tricks that you need to succeed. On today's video, we're diving head first into the captivating world of co-ops versus condos. The big Apple's real estate landscape is unlike any other. And understanding the unique offerings of co-ops and condos is your key to unlocking your dream home. We'll uncover the differences and nuances that make these two options tick. And by the end of this video, you'll have all the info that you need to make an informed decision. That said, let's get to it. Condos and co-ops share similarities, but also have unique characteristics that offer a variety of options for residents. In most places, Condos are what most people buy. But in New York City, co-ops reign supreme, outnumbering condos by a staggering 75% as per most estimates. Let's talk ownership. Starting our review with condos, it is important to know that when you become a condo owner, not only do you snag a fantastic apartment, but you also claim a slice of the ownership rights to the property's communal areas. On the flip side, co-op ownership doesn't mean you actually own your apartment outright. Instead, your money is treated as an investment in shares of a corporation that essentially is classified as your building. The number of shares you get depends on your apartment size, and this grants you the right to reside in your chosen unit. When it comes to the closing process, condo buyers receive a deed for their apartment as they would when they purchase any other piece of real estate. On the other hand, co-op buyers are handed a proprietary lease for their co-op unit. Both have the right to live in their apartments, one, the condo, through the rights granted to them as a real estate owner through a deed, the other through the rights granted to them as a corporation shareholder and the proprietary lease. In terms of amenities, both condos and co-ops can benefit from the same set of perks and depending on the age of the building and location can come with a doorman and superintendent on standby. In some cases, a luxury concierge takes care of your every need. The amenities available can range from the simple, like a storage room in the basement, to the extravagant, including a lush landscape terrace, a village room for your leisure, a cozy piano room, a private screening room for movie nights, a children's playroom, and even a fully equipped gym to keep you fit and healthy. In New York City, the new neighborhoods, once considered outliers, but not considered hip, are where you'll find the condos. And being that condo buildings did not become common in New York City until the 1970s, it is most likely that if living in a modern floor to ceiling glass house in the sky is more of your style, you will likely find yourself looking at condos versus co-ops. This is because condos are often more modern in that sense. Apartment seekers will also notice that since available land is very limited in Manhattan, the newest condominiums, the condos, are most likely to be found in up and coming French neighborhoods on the far east and west side of the island. In Queens, the Bronx, and Brooklyn, you'll see that a lot of the new construction condos have been built and continue to be built in former industrial areas along the waterfront, like the now famous and highly desirable area of Long Island City and Williamsburg. When it comes to cost differences between condos and co ops, it is often found that condos are more attractive to home buyers as they offer more attractive down payment options. For example, you can get into a condo for as low as 3% when compared to the co-op counterparts where 20 to 25% down payments are normal. Keep in mind, however, while this may appear to be a no-brainer option when selecting between the two options, condos tend to have a higher price point over co-ops. Closing costs on a condo are also higher than co-ops due to their classification being considered real property versus co-ops whose shares are considered personal property in terms of our real estate purchase. Let's look at one example. Consider for a minute the purchase of a $1 million condo with an $800,000 mortgage with closing costs for this purchase would involve fees that would include title insurance for you as the purchaser, title insurance for the lender, title searches, recording fees, the New York State mansion tax, which is 1% transfer tax that applies to buyers of properties $1 million or higher, and the New York State mortgage recording tax. In total, your out-of-pocket closing costs, without any other applicable fees like lender fees, which vary, would be over $32,000. In comparison, the closing costs for a co-op would not have any of the title or recording fees and would be limited to just the New York State mansion tax, or 1%. Again, this is not counting the variable applicable fees like appraisal fees, which vary depending on the property, both and are applicable to both condos and co-ops alike. Taking a look at the monthly charges between condos and co-ops is another factor we need to consider when comparing the two. Condo owners have a monthly bill called common charges. These charges are used for the upkeep of the building like common areas, 
landscape and payment with staff, and often some of the utilities. In addition to the monthly common charges, it is important to know that condo owners are also responsible for paying their own property taxes. And even though this is the case, condo owners' combined monthly total is often lower than the co-op owners. Co-op owners have a monthly bill called maintenance charges or maintenance fees. Similar to condos, the monthly fee goes to the basic upkeep of the property, the staff needed to keep the building running properly, but the reason co-op fees seem to be higher than condo fees is because co-op maintenance charges often include at least part of what is referred to as the underlying mortgage. That is, the mortgage for the building as a corporation. Granted, monthly fees can vary depending on the size of the building. For both condos and co-ops, it's important to know that maintenance and common charges are not set in stones. Any major expense, such as a new roof that's needed for the building, a new lobby, more staff members, or anything else of the like, may trigger what's called an assessment, which is something that the board members decide on and which can increase your monthly obligation. Here's a quick tip. When you are in the market to buy a condo or co-op, ask for information on any ongoing or planned assessments. Don't get caught holding the bag with unforeseen fees that can throw your whole budget out of whack. Moving on, let's talk about the board and rules for each. Once you are in the process of buying a condo or co-op, it's important to keep in mind that apart from having to qualify for a mortgage if you are applying for one, you also need to apply for residency into the building you are considering. In addition, your condo or co-op will impose certain rules that you as the residents will need to abide by to live in the building. Condos tend to have fewer rules, including less restrictions on the use of foreign funds for the purchase. Condos also allow international investors to buy and rent out their spaces, usually with some caveats, but none that are crazy. Condos also allow the apartments to be sublet or leased out to another party relatively easy compared to the subletting process for co-ops. However, note that some condo associations may impose more rules than others, and no two associations are ever the same. As a result, it's important that prospective buyers do their research to determine what is and what is not allowed. In contrast, co-op boards tend to have more rules than condos and may have stricter guidelines. For example, the rules that discourage some domestic buyers and just about all international buyers are co-op restrictions on subletting. Policies vary building by building, but generally, when co-ops allow shareholders to sublet their apartments, it is on a limited basis, such as for one or two years, out of every five. And to do so, owners have to typically reside in the property for a certain period of time before subletting. In some cases, as many as three years. Additionally, owners typically have to pay a fee to be allowed to sublet, and their subletters are subject to board approvals. This all has to happen before the apartment can be rented. Condo boards tend to be less demanding, and while they can request a pact on a buyer to review background, finances, etc., there is no interview process, as is commonly found with co-ops, and the building only has the right of first refusal, meaning they have to approve or they have to buy the apartment themselves. This means that when you have a signed contract, unless something happens with that buyer, like financing issues, the deal is as good as done. Most co-op boards have a rigorous and often lengthy application process that can require buyers to hand over financial information, submitting to employment verification, and possibly a personal background check. In a co-op, not only do you have to have the means to make the purchase, you also have to be approved by the board after submitting an application, which in itself can be a very detailed and daunting process. What is not so great about it as well is that a buyer can go through this process and do everything right, and with little to no reason whatsoever, the board can reject that applicant after their interview. In some cases, they can even do so before it happens, just because something under package did not meet their guidelines. I have seen deals where there has been zero rhyme or reason for a rejection. This is why it is very important to carefully review and analyze every single detail about our co-op guidelines before attempting to put an offer in. For example, here is a view of some common guidelines we commonly see here for co-ops in the area. You'll see some of the rules we talked about in terms of investors, renting, subletting, there's rules about credit, rules about board approval, rules about pets, rules about financing maximums that are allowed, and a big one, there is a rule about the maximum DTI the debt to income ratio of 30%, which is to say for this building, if you, for example, make 10 grand per month and you have expenses of $3,100 per month, including your potential mortgage payment and the maintenance charges that you would incur for this building, you would not qualify for this building, even though you have excess cash available to do each month. That is because your debt to income ratio is over 30%. It all comes down to buyer preference, your needs and qualifications, 
when choosing between condos and co-ops. If you would rather march to the beat of your own drum and you value flexibility, then a condo may be the wise choice for you. But keep in mind that this freedom comes at a cost. As we saw, it is possible to get into a condo with a low down payment of 3% and even 0% down with some loan programs out there. But condos are nearly always more expensive than their equivalent co-op counterparts when it comes to overall price and closing costs. The good news is that you are more likely to be able to rent them out as an investor if that is what you are looking for. In contrast, co-ops focus on establishing a stable in for the long run group of residents and it's a smart choice for those who qualify and who want to plant roots in a building as they are less transient than condos. Just be prepared to be analyzed, probed, poked, and scrutinized in the process. This being the case, if you are in the market as a buyer, do keep an eye out for co-op sponsor units. These are apartments that don't require board approval, and they also, in most cases, allow for a low down payment. Granted, they are rare, and I cannot stress this enough. It's like finding a unicorn in a hayfield, but they do exist and can be an excellent way to get into a co-op with more flexibility. Again, be on the lookout for sponsor units. These are fantastic. The bottom line when considering co-ops and condos is that both have their advantages and both have their disadvantages, but they each have their own appeal, which just depends on what you as a buyer need. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey through the exciting world of New York City real estate. If you found this video helpful or interesting, please consider giving it a thumbs up and hitting that subscribe button. That way, you'll never miss out on our future property insights and content. And hey, if you're in the market for your dream home here in New York City, or simply want to chat about real estate in a city that never sleeps, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm Little Evangelista, your New York City tries to area real estate guy, and I'm here to help you navigate the exciting real estate landscape in and around the Big Apple. So hit me up with your questions. Let's embark on this real estate adventure together. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next video.